Life is like a long bicycle ride. You have to work to get anywhere. You have to maintain a balance. You have to keep a careful eye on where you are going. You will run into occasional bumps and potholes along the way, but you persevere. And in the end, most of us realize what a wonderful ride it has been. And my life has been a great ride. I'm Jim Hickey, and this is my life's journey. I was a blue collar kid, born in what some people call Downriver Detroit. My father settled in the area after he left his home in Fall River, Massachusetts. After he met and married my mother, Catherine, they had three children. So I have two older sisters, Joan and Shirley. Times when we were kids weren't always easy. We had to make sacrifices, but one thing my father insisted upon was that all of his children would get a formal education. And thanks to our parents, we all did. My dad was always sure to let me know how proud he was of things I accomplished. I was a Boy Scout when I was a youngster, and I reached the rank of Eagle Scout, and he was bursting with pride. I wish he would have been around later on when, as an adult, I was named a Distinguished Eagle Scout. Uh, that's a special rank that the Boy Scouts give to eagles who in their adult lives have gone on to distinguish themselves one way or another. I wish Dad could have seen that. He was a, a wonderfully humorous Irishman. And you know, he was such a guiding light in my life, such a force. Mom was very religious. She believed in contributing to and taking part in church activities. Thus, I was very active in church youth activities growing up. She always called me Seamus, especially when I was in trouble. I knew when I was in trouble when she would say, Seamus, do this or don't do that. Uh oh, big problems. She also made sure I knew she was proud of things that I have done. It goes in phases, you know, different chunks of my life and recollections of dad. Him and I in um, uh, Indian guides, you know, doing that um, with, with the feathers and in our outfits. And then when he moved, then it became these concentrated periods of time, you know, weekends and trips. Together, we went route searching in Ireland. He was a young boy at the time. And we drove the Ring of Kerry in a rented car. And as we were driving along, I saw a big sign on the road that said Hickey Memorials, five kilometers that way. And I remember saying to Blair, look, there's a monument to our family. Let's go find it. A Hickey monument. How cool is that? And so we come around the corner. Finally, there it is. Well, memorials are what they call tombstones. And so it was just some guy named Hickey who made tombstones. Blair has visited several foreign countries. He has visited and has talked with and socialized 
with the king of Liechtenstein. We've been traveling and ABC called and said, I know you're on vacation, but the king is handing the power over to his son, the prince, and I know you're near there. And if you want to do the story and take your son. So we had lunch with the prince of Liechtenstein in the castle. He's always been a best friend and a professional role model and inspiration. Um, and that's just pretty awesome. Yeah. ABC would give us, those of us overseas, once a year, one month off to go home, to visit family. And I was on my way home for that particular year in 1986. Um, and I went by way of Club Med in Martinique. While I was there, I met this young woman that I found very attractive, very appealing. Her name is Marcia Clever. The second week of being in uh, Martinique, I met my husband. We were both on the beach at the time, and so I put my belongings down on the seat and went and got my lunch, came and sat down, and the next thing I know, the person's belongings that's next to me happens to be Jim. I knew very, very early on, uh, within two days, that if I ever heard from him again, whenever I got back to the U.S., that I was going to marry him. I had to go back to South Africa. She had to go back to Dallas. But we kept up this long-distance relationship. Finally, we decided we needed to be together. She quit her job in Dallas after being there only eight or nine months and moved to South Africa to be with me. I'm astounded that someone would make that sacrifice. We lived in Johannesburg and got married within that year. We flew home to Michigan and to my sister's house where we had the wedding. My son was our best man. And here we are, decades, decades later. Um, it was meant to be. After living in Hollywood for a while, Blair met the woman he would marry, Laura, and now have two daughters, our granddaughters, Alexandra and Charlotte, who are just the most wonderful grandchildren in the world. Watching him with them, I'm, I'm loving how playful he is, and I'm loving that he's down on the floor with them and you know, crawling around and, and playing and being silly. We're so proud of the girls. They're beautiful people, uh, different personalities. Alexandra looks and takes after her mother. Charlotte looks like Blair looked when he was a boy. So, and uh, it's fun to watch them grow. Jim has blossomed since he has grandchildren. Um, I think part of his retiring was that he really wanted to be able to spend more time with them. Sometimes um, Alexandra will call Pap at night and ask if he will do the bedtime story. It's, it's just, it's so charming and it's heartwarming and he loves it. Family history is important. Uh, we come from a long line of Irishmen and a long line of Germanic people, both of whom have rich cultural histories. It's important for the family to know that. Where did we come from? How did we get here? My career actually started on a, on a rainy Sunday fall afternoon in 1964 when I was at, at college at Western Michigan University. The campus radio station happened to be located across the parking lot. And they had a big sign in the window that said, Help Wanted. And I thought, I think I can do that. So I went over there and they asked me, uh, had, did I have any experience? Not really. Could I cut an audition tape? And immediately I said, oh yeah, no problem. Whatever I did apparently worked because they said, sure, you come work with us. My first ever, ever radio gig was a midnight to 3 a.m. jazz program on this campus radio station. It was a fellow student 
who actually sparked my interest in broadcast journalism, Henry Earp, just a year older than me, was the WIDR news director. And I recall clearly he came to me one day as a freshman, I was a freshman, he said something to the effect, Hickey, are you going to be a disc jockey all your life? I think you should come work with me next semester in the news department. In fact, he said, if you come work with me, I'll make you the assistant news director. And I thought, wow, what a business. I'm a freshman and already I have a title. That changed my life. I credit Henry with really giving me the start of what turned out to be a lifelong career. And he and I have remained lifelong friends. During the summers of my college years, I worked at a restaurant at Henry Ford's Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. One of the other people who worked in the restaurant was uh, a waitress whose cousin was the chief announcer for the radio station in Kalamazoo. That was WKZO Radio and TV. That announcer introduced me to the news director who hired me as a part-time writer while I was still a student at Western Michigan. And by the time I graduated, I was anchoring this weekend 11 o'clock news on television. It was at WKZO where I had my first opportunity to report for the network, which was immensely exciting for a young college student. And there was a story that we had reported about sighting, UFO sightings, aliens. CBS got a hold of the story and was interested in it. So they called and I answered the phone and the guy on the other, said, I, other end said, what do you have on, on the aliens? And I said, well, we have tape, well, we've been reporting it, but it's not aliens, it's swamp gas. He said, Pe but people still think it's aliens. I said, yeah, they do. He said, it's a great story, can you do it for us? I said, do it for you? Yeah, report it for us. So I put together a story and I was able to say, Jim Hickey reporting for CBS News. What a thrill. That was just great. The 60s were turbulent times. Anti-Vietnam War protests and civil rights demonstrations erupted on college campuses all across the country, including in Western Michigan. It was then I faced a life-altering decision. While as a reporter covering and filming a protest on the WMU campus, where of course I was still a student, I saw friends and classmates confronting riot helmeted police. They saw me too, and some of them shouted things like, hey Hickey, whose side are you on anyway? I empathized with the demonstrators and pretty much agreed with their views. But I also knew the protests would be short-term and my new career would last, hopefully, for the rest of my life. My choice was clear. I put the camera to my eye and continued filming. I was also enrolled in ROTC at Western, which meant I had a two-year military obligation after I graduated. As an Army lieutenant in 1970, I was fortunate to land a job at Fort Benning, Georgia as the base radio TV information officer. Our unit, among other things, produced programs for the new volunteer army and served as press liaisons during the widely publicized court-martial of Lieutenant William Calley, who was convicted of murdering Vietnamese civilians in what is known as the My Lai Massacre. There is an old film clip which shows a young officer standing just to the right of an MP as Callie exits the courthouse the day he was found guilty. That young officer was me. A few months before I was to get out of the Army, I started looking around for a job, a radio or a television reporting job. I wanted to continue my career. I'd been away from the career for a couple of years, even though I was connected to it because of my job at Fort Benning. I was away from active involvement as a reporter. One day, uh, the news director of the local ABC affiliate in Columbus, Georgia, came into my office, Alf Lemming, and he asked me that day, how, how are things? And I said, well, I'm having problems finding a job. 
And I remember Al looked at me and he said, hell, I'll hire you. I said, you will? He said, sure, I know you. I know what you can do and I could use you. I, I have an opening. Well, okay then, uh, deal. So I went to work for Al a few months later in his news department at WTVM Channel 9 in Columbus, Georgia. Jim Hickey, Channel 9 News. Since I had done some disc jockey work in both the Army and in college, I also moonlighted as a DJ under the name Randy Scott at WDAK, a Columbus rock and roll radio station. In those days, being in the Deep South, they called it Big Johnny Reb Radio, complete with the yell. Yeah! That was the year Tony Orlando and Dawn had a number one hit called Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree. If you receive my letter telling you I'd soon be free. The lyrics are the story of a man coming home from prison, not knowing whether his girl would welcome him back. Rick Hubbard, a fellow DAK DJ, and I produced a radio play complete with sound effects about the story that got national attention. Born under the creative direction of Rick Hubbard and Randy Scott, WDAK, Columbus, Georgia. Programmer's Digest was a bi-monthly Nashville audio publication for the broadcasting industry. We were featured in the June 1973 edition. Randy provides the narrative and Rick the characterizations in The Yellow Ribbon Story. The bus was headed out of New York. They were going to Fort Lauderdale. As the bus passed through New Jersey, they began to notice bingo. The radio play was a big hit. Phones rang off the hook with listeners wanting to buy it. It was great fun. I knew that I wanted to move on. I knew that I didn't want to stay in a small market all my life. I set goals for myself. This is WSB Television, Channel 2 in Atlanta. And this is Action News. I applied at WSB in Atlanta which was a major market. Big TV station for the South. WSB hired me in 1974. This was a period of time when television news coverage was changing dramatically because it was going from film to videotape. Ken Tivitt was the executive producer at WSB when I was working there, and Ken had a vision of electronic news gathering, as we called it then, ENG. He saw a couple of other stations experimenting with this thing called ENG, which involved videotape, instantaneous turnaround of video, and live capability to be able to do live on the scene reporting, which no one had ever done. So I became his live action reporter, and Ken today says I probably was a pioneer in this live reporting that now is so common that everybody does. Nobody was doing it in our day. Independent truckers are on strike. Jim Hickey has the live eye in Paulsboro for the latest. Jim? Well, Vince, this is the scene at truck stops all across the country. Truck drivers have parked their rigs, they've turned off the keys, and they settle in for the long haul. It's pretty difficult to tell at this point just how effective the trucker strike is because... The drivers it was a skill set that served me well at my next job. KYW-TV in Philadelphia, beginning in 1976. It was a big job in a big town in a big market. I was the New Jersey bureau chief for a while. I was honored and flattered when asked to be a judge for this annual beauty contest. Philadelphia was very good to me. Good evening. Carol Erickson is off tonight. I'm Jim Hickey. The city of brotherly love is facing an unprecedented civil rights lawsuit tonight. I covered many different kinds of stories. Pope John Paul II came to Philadelphia. I was able to travel with him the first time and travel with him to Iowa. Later, I traveled with him a lot and when I worked for ABC and was posted in Rome. One weekend while working at KYW in Philadelphia, Dad came to visit. That night, we were out at a restaurant having dinner and he was uncharacteristically quiet. And I finally asked him, is, is there something wrong? He said, no, no, nothing's wrong. I'm just thinking, what about? He said, all that stuff you showed me today at the TV station. I said, yeah. Can you do all that stuff? I said, well, let's say I have a working knowledge of most of it, and in a pinch, I could probably do most of it. Yeah, I guess so. Hmm, he said. 
Then he looked at me and he said, well, I guess you don't have to go to night school after all. Eureka. He finally got it. He finally decided that I'd made a career and I was making a success of it. And I never loved him more than in that moment. I'm Jim Hickey. Thanks for being with us. Have a good night and a good week. So in 1980, I got this call from ABC News to come up and interview, and I was hired as a correspondent. Tonight, Jim Hickey has a special assignment report on union concessions and the critical period ahead for labor. Ed Krauss has worked at Baltimore's SK Meat Company for 29 years. Tonight, Jim Hickey has a special report on its toll and its treatment. The National Council on Compulsive Gambling recommends that at least 1% of state gaming profits go for treatment. The council says the betting public has a responsibility to recognize compulsive gambling not only as an individual addiction, but also as a serious social problem. One day I got a call from one of the vice presidents at ABC telling me that the company was opening a new bureau in Frankfurt, West Germany, and it was to be a travel bureau. And anyone who worked there had to be prepared to go anywhere on a moment's notice. And I jumped at the chance. I traveled and traveled and traveled literally everywhere. Jim Hickey, ABC News, Beirut. Spent some time in Lebanon during the Civil War. That was really my first taste of real combat. I was not armed with a rifle. I was armed with a pad and pencil and a microphone. Fatah field commanders concede they can hold out here for only so long, and that it's just a matter of time before they pull back into the city of Tripoli and do their fighting there. One of the stories we covered was this intramural battle between two factions of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. They were fighting each other for power. Forces loyal to Yasser Arafat took up positions on the main road between Tripoli and the Badawi refugee camp. So efforts continued throughout the day to hold off an all-out siege of Tripoli with all sides talking about the possibility of a ceasefire, but everyone also waiting for the other guy to make the first move. Overseas and in the Indian city of Bhopal, thousands of residents... One of the big stories that we covered out of Frankfurt was in India. Out of town. As ABC's Jim Hickey reports, no one wants to be around when Union Carbide tries to neutralize the rest of that deadly gas. Bhopal's train station was mobbed today. People trying to get as far away as they can from the Union Carbide plant before Sunday. In 1984, there was this horrible leak of Union Carbide gas in the town of Bhopal, and we covered that every day for a long time. Storage tanks inside the plant still contain 30 tons of the toxic methyl isocyanate. The immediate problem for Union Carbide is how to dispose of it safely. ABC moved me to South Africa in 1985. Um, I was appointed as the bureau chief and was there for four years. Again, the right time, the right place for a journalist. Those four years were some of the most intense years of the uprising to fight against apartheid, which was South Africa's official uh, policy of racial segregation. I was fortunate while in South Africa to become friendly with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was a major voice, anti-apartheid voice, well respected, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his fight against apartheid. I was visiting the bishop at his home one day in Soweto. While we're talking in his living room, his phone rings in the other room and he goes to answer it. And I can hear him getting more and more excited as he's talking on the phone. He finally hangs up, he comes back into the room, his eyes are bright and shining and glistening and he's smiling. He says, Nelson's coming home, Nelson's coming home. He had just been told that the government had agreed, finally, at long last, to release, release Nelson Mandela from prison. Tutu was so excited, he started dancing around his living room, singing and hollering, and I'm watching him from the chair, amused by what he's doing, and he reaches over, grabs me by the arms, pulls me up out of the chair. Now we're both dancing around the living room because Nelson Mandela's coming home. Uh, what a great memory that is. He was just so excited. 
1989, ABC transferred me to Rome. When it became clear Mandela was coming out of prison, ABC sent me back to Johannesburg. So I was fortunate enough to be at Mandela's Soweto home the day he arrived after 27 years in prison. And there he was, this, this giant of a figure, this legendary man. There he was, flesh and bone. Rome became another story that involved many different facets. One of my beats was the Vatican, where I was sort of reunited with Pope John Paul II and traveled with him on several of his pilgrimages to Africa. From Rome, I was traveling a lot again, covering really big, I mean major stories that today occupy whole chapters in history books, such as the fall of the Berlin Wall, the downfall of Soviet-style communism in Russia, and Desert Storm, the first U.S. war against Iraq. Things changed a lot for all the networks at the end of the 1980s and early 1990s. No longer was there money to spend on bureaus in every European capital in every country around the world. Uh, the salad days of the early 80s were gone. So ABC, along with the other networks, started closing down bureaus to save money, including the Rome Bureau. And I was brought back home to New York in 1991. And I worked uh, at, on the TV side out of New York from 91 to 95. I was informed that there would be big changes in the fall of 95. And the company said, we do not want to lose you as a journalist, but we see different roles for you. And they said, radio, ABC radio, now seems to be the place for you where you can be most beneficial to us. So then for the next 17 years, I was a radio correspondent. I anchored it first, but then we decided we need, needed a go-to lead reporter in the morning to kick off the news in the morning, so I was named the national correspondent. And those are your political insights. I'm Jim Hickey, ABC News. Jim had this wonderful way of writing that just made it seem consistent, I think, with his personality that he's Cool as a cucumber, nothing rattles him, and he can just go off and, and write his story as a casual observer. And that always, it's, it's a skill that I think has served me well, certainly throughout my career. So there was a whole range of stories we covered. One of the most dramatic was 9-11. I was, for the first day on that September 11th day, the key anchor for radio for our continuing coverage of the tragedy of the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and the plane crash in Pennsylvania. And that horrible, horrible day. This is live coverage from ABC News. I'm Jim Hickey. An airplane has crashed into the upper levels of one of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan in New York. I kept saying to myself, Jim, you have to be a reporter. You have to be unemotional. You have to maintain. Don't let this story carry you away because you have a responsibility here. You have to tell people what is going on in a straightforward, unemotional way. That was hard. That was really hard. When I look back on my career, I see it very linearly, pretty much a straight line. Once I decided back in college that this is what I wanted to do, one thing happened right after another, and I set goals. And through fortune, hard work, and good luck, I was able to follow that path. What has always impressed me is how dedicated he was to his work. We were overseas during the time of many, many, many changes. The fall of apartheid and the Berlin Wall came down and there was much upheaval in the Middle East. 
I can look back now and I'm pretty satisfied with what I did and what was done for me, in some cases to me, but mostly for me. And it was a career that was most rewarding and most satisfying. And I don't think there's anything other that I would have ever done. Coming to Charleston is the first time that Marcia and I have moved to a place of our choosing. It's the first time that we are able to look around and say, yes, we want to live there because we want to. In retirement, I think it's important to give back, to contribute to society somehow. Back in New Jersey, I became deeply involved as a volunteer in the arts, which I believe are crucial to the health of a community. The primary initiative that I worked with Jim on was the MoCo Arts Corridor Partnership. Now, Jim and a few key players had already begun efforts with regards to this partnership. I have watched him and participated with him in his leadership capacity and his unending and unquestionable enthusiasm about the power of the arts. Giving back gives me a sense of fulfillment, especially in retirement. Um, I like to stay active. Um, I'm on the advisory board now here at the College of Charleston advising the Department of Communication. Similar things that I did at Monmouth University in New Jersey and at my alma mater, Western Michigan University in Michigan. Jim is all about the student. And one of the things that I absolutely love about him is that he's all about the student. So he wanted them to take the lead. He's the go-getter. He was our charge. We miss him. <laughs> so when I first met Jim as a junior, we did a Com Talks program. He brought in Kate O'Brien, who was a friend of his and also a very prominent member of the media. He was like this larger-than-life personality. For example, if I were talking to my granddaughters, I would say, you have no idea how famous your grandfather was. Pap was known by millions of people across the United States and overseas, and that um, people relied on Pap to keep them updated on what the news was and to be able to help them make a decision on how they were viewing the world. When you look back on your life, and I'm sure many people, when they do, wonder, how did I get here? What have I done to allow me to be in the situation that I'm in? Good, bad, or indifferent. How did it all happen? And you start reviewing, it's like looking at a film backwards. Things that happen to you, for you, against you, all of those things. And it seems to me, in my case, anywhere, this, this right time, right place, has been with me all of my life. I'm a firm believer in fate. I believe things happen for a reason. And you just have to listen to those things. A good friend of mine says you have to listen to the universe because the universe speaks to you. And I believe that's true. Uh, how does it speak? It speaks to all of us in different ways. You just have to find a way to listen to it and follow that path. At this age, it's all about fun, and that's what I'm doing.
Another thing people should know is that when he was younger, he had an afro. He wasn't always gray-haired and short-cut. I think that would be a good thing to know. He had a full head of hair at one point when I met him.